if you teach math, you understand how difficult teaching word problems can be. You may have even tried so-called strategies like cubes and keywords. And what you probably found was it looked like students were being successful with, with word problems when you taught them the strategy, but that they were unable to be successful when they worked independently, either on, on a unit test or on state tests. In this video, I'll show you why those strategies of cubes and keywords uh, just don't work and can actually be detrimental to students' ability to learn math. I'll also show you a better way, the Polya process, which helps students break down word problems in a way that promotes deep conceptual understanding and helps them to better apply math to the real world. Finally, I'll show you where to go to find resources like lesson plans and further reading that will help you make teaching word problems a breeze. So I'd like to share with you three reasons why you should be very careful about using things like cubes and keywords in your math classroom. Now, if you're not familiar, cubes is basically a, a trick that's supposed to help students with word problems. The C stands for circle the numbers, the U stands for underline the question, and those are fine. If they want to do those things, it's not going to hurt them. The real issue comes when we get to B, which stands for box the keywords. Now, the idea here is that each problem has a keyword that tells us what operation to perform. Um, but that's not actually true. I mean, the whole purpose of giving students word problems is for them to consider mathematical scenarios in the real world. And in the real world, when you're trying to use math to solve a problem, there is no keyword. Um, so, you know, the list will say if it says sum, you add, if it says groups, you multiply. Um, but even if this works, you know, it may help students pass a test, but it's not going to actually help them apply math to the real world, which is the whole point of word problems in the first place. Now, that also leads into the second reason why we shouldn't use cubes, and it's because simply that it doesn't work. Um, once upon a time, maybe, math problems on standardized tests would contain a keyword, like it would say sum and then they had to add, or it would say groups and they had to multiply. But the test makers are aware of cubes, and so for many, many years, they've written questions that could not be solved with keywords. Because again, the point is for students to understand the scenario and use their conceptual understanding of math to solve it. So for example, they might write a question that says, there are five students and, and 20 cookies. How many does each student get? And if the students look at the keyword list, then they'll, they'll simply multiply. There are countless examples of situations like this where the keywords are misleading, and so frequently students will learn keywords. They're not trying to understand the problem, and, and they sit down, they get the problem wrong, and furthermore, they can't even explain what they did or why they got it wrong because they're not even trying to think. They've been taught to just find a keyword. Now, the third reason to rethink cubes is that cubes calls itself a strategy, but it's not a strategy. It's actually a process, okay? So a process is a series of steps that we follow to complete a task. So for example, if I was supposed to mail flyers out, right? The first step I would do would be to, to fold the paper. The second is put it on the envelope, uh, seal it closed, put a stamp on it, and then drop it in the mailbox. That's a process. It's a series of steps. I can repeat them again and again, and I'm actually going to get the task done. Um, but that's not really what we're trying to teach students in school, is to follow processes. We want to teach them strategies. And Cubes calls itself a strategy, but it's not. It's a series of steps. Um, in order to teach students strategies, we need to give them mathematical tools and give them uh, practice with applying the right tool for the right scenario. So for example, if somebody is trying to build a deck on uneven ground, that requires strategy. They need to know how to use a level. They need to know how to use a drill, a hammer, and they need to select what's the right tool for each scenario. How do I account for the fact that the ground is higher here and lower there? That's strategic thinking. That's what we really want students to do in word problem solving. And that is 
how the polio process works. So let's take a look at an alternative, the polio process, which actually works better and encourages conceptual understanding and deeper thinking. A much more effective approach to teaching word problems is to use the polio process. It has four steps, understand, plan, solve, and reflect. And the difference really comes down to the plan phase. This is where we're encouraging students to think strategically in formulating their problem as opposed to just uh, picking out a word randomly and hoping that's the right operation. So the first step, understand. The goal is to understand what is being asked and what's being given. Now, you might even use something like circling the numbers and you know underlining a question as part of the understand phase. But really what we want students to do is demonstrate their understanding so by asking a question, what's being asked in this problem, what information is being given. That's where they're selecting the right information, encourage them to use the numbers and the units. Next is plan. Uh, this is where students actually, I think of it as translation. They're translating from a real world scenario to a mathematical representation that the, they can then solve in the solve phase. So if they choose write an equation, the solve is to write and simplify the equation. If they choose a method like draw a picture, the solve is actually drawing the picture and showing how that picture creates a solution. The final step is reflect or look back. This is where students check their work, um, share with peers or present to the class, or they can write a short reflection about how they solved the problem and what they learned from it. I'd like to take another minute to zoom in on the plan phase because it's probably the most overlooked part of the process and it's also the most complicated. Like creating a plan requires that students understand how to approach the problem. Uh, this is the part that's really glossed over when, when we get to keywords. But in order to do this effectively, students need to, to take a breath. And we all know that a lot of times when we give students a word problem, they just want to jump right in and start performing some calculation, regardless of whether it's the right calculation. Uh, for that reason, I designed the word problem pre-solver, which is a graphic organizer where students actually don't have to find an answer to a problem. We just have them ask certain guiding questions to show that they've thought about it. So that's one way to get them to be better at this is just to take the time to do it. But the other part is that we really want to actually teach them the different strategies. So one strategy is to work backwards. And there's a classic problem called the mango problem that highlights the work backwards strategy. So in that problem, uh, the king wakes up one night and he goes downstairs and he eats one-sixth of the mangoes that are in a bowl. Uh, later, the queen comes down, she eats one-fifth of the mangoes in the bowl. Next, somebody eats one-fourth and one-third and so on. And then at the end, we have three mangoes left and we have to figure out how many mangoes we started with. Now, if you think of taking a, a bowl of mangoes and subtracting one-sixth of it and then subtracting one-fifth and one-fourth, it gets really complicated fast. But if you just start with the three at the end and then work backwards based on how much each person ate, it's much simpler. So um, choosing problems like that for each of the different strategies helps students understand what the benefits are of that particular strategy. And then eventually they can choose the right strategy when they're presented with an unknown problem. So if this video has helped you take some of the mystery out of teaching word problems, I'd really appreciate it if you hit like and subscribe to our channel. Um, but of course, a short video like this isn't going to teach you everything you need to know about teaching word problems. So here's some resources to help you take the next step. The first thing you'll want to do is download our Polya organizer. Um, it's a graphic organizer I designed that can be used really with any word problem and it will help guide your students through the four steps of understand, plan, solve, and reflect. That's a free download available on our website at roomtodiscover.com slash polya. Next, you'll want to visit our online store at roomtodiscover.com slash tpt. 
There you can find the word problem pre-solver that I mentioned earlier, as well as several complete word problems lessons. Um, each lesson is built around a interactive digital Google Slides activities, and it includes a full lesson plan. It includes a, a teacher's guide with an intro to word problems and the specific strategies that you want to use for each of the word problems in the activity. There's an, also an article on teaching word problems on our blog at roomtodiscover.com slash word problems that goes into a little more depth again with how to teach the process and some of the strategies. Finally, if you really want to become a master of teaching word problems, you should enroll in one of our upcoming workshops. You can find all of our workshops at roomtodiscover.com slash workshops. Uh, we have upcoming sessions that are open to the public where you can register for an individual seat or you can schedule a private session for your school. All of our workshops are real-time, online, interactive workshops. There's a live facilitator. You'll work with other teachers and there are breakout sessions where you can collaborate and you'll have time to plan your own lessons, and you'll get access to all the resources you need to use these strategies in your classroom the very next day. So thank you for watching, and thank you for giving your students room to discover.